Um, I do have one uh, item of business I need to take care of because last time I was here, it was, hey, Todd, how are you? Where's your wife? And what's up with your kids? I mean, they don't really want anything to do with me. So I think I did do one fatherly thing. Do you guys have the slide? I brought one picture. There they are. There they are. So I did my fatherly duty. Cade, he's in college, uh, Northwestern. Uh, Noah and Sadie, and they're all growing up really fast. So there you have it. Um, that's the better part of my life right there. So anyway, it's really great to be back. It's really great to be here and sharing with you. Um, I'm always thrilled to be back and to see familiar faces and to, and to share God's word with you. Um, one of the great things about this place is not only seeing familiar faces, but to hear all about the ministries that are happening here, to uh, learn about the people that you're coming in contact with and the lives that you're changing. I love lo looking at your bulletin and seeing the classes that are being offered. It's exciting. Um, I would, I'm not going to uh, uh, hesitate in advertising those classes and being a part of um, a group, of being a part of giving back. And so we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be landing in John chapter 6. And before we get started, though, um, Lee did a fantastic job of setting up what we're going to be talking about today. And I want to share with you some things. These are fantastic. These are some uh, gifts. And I mean, we all had Christmas. Well, these are mine. And uh, aren't they spectacular? I mean, look at this one. Um, it's, uh, it's not that big, but this is good. This one here, I like this one, too. Uh, it's all shiny. And uh, I like looking at them. They're, they're great. I mean, they're in my house. Sometimes my friends will come over and they'll see them. And, uh, and I, I, I make sure that I move them around so when they come over a second time, they know that I've played with them. You know, and this one, now I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, where do you get that wrapping paper? I have no idea, but isn't it great? Uh, this one here, Snowman. And this one you can tell that's kind of wrinkly, which is by design, because when people come and see them, I want to make sure they know that I've used it and touched it and stuff, so that one's a good one here, but I have to tell you, probably, I mean, I can't go without showing this one, Merry Christmas, and, you know, I make sure also to dust them off, make sure they don't get dusty, and then, like I said, sometimes, once in a while, uh, this one in particular, I'll just put it in my car and drive around with it, because, you know, hanging out with gifts like this is cool, and people will see it. So I need people to see that I've got gifts, so that's cool. And they go, those are some awesome gifts. And I'm like, <laughs> I know. So then I would tell you that my probably my favorite one of all time is this one right here. I mean, and then I had this friend stop to my house, and he goes, hey, that's really cool. Are you going to unwrap it and use it? I said, are you kidding me? Look at this. Look at this blue, and it's kind of shiny. And he said, you know, if you opened it and used it, you might get more joy out of it. I'm like, okay. I mean, he was a pastor, so he's kind of wacky. So anyway, but this is, this is awesome. And, and also, you know, I had another crazy person tell me, you know, if you use some of your gifts uh, that other people don't have, you can like, give them away. I was like, give them away? Are you kidding? What would I have people look at when they come to my house or drive around in my car? I mean, those are, mm, those are some good times right there. So, I don't know. Though, you want to come see him, come to my house. It'd be great. So, I might even let you touch one of them. But, mm, don't rush the stage when I'm done talking. That would be embarrassing. So, we'll get back to the gifts here in a minute. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth in the form of a baby and died on a cross and rose again. Even though we were not worthy, you did die on a cross for our sins. You demonstrated your love for us. Even though why we are still sinners, why we have done so many things to fall short, you died on a cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Lee pointed out, we're in this tweener time. We just had Christmas. And we just learned about this baby Jesus being born in Bethlehem and Judea. And the days of Herod, Herod, the King Herod. Well, and so this is a great time of year where stories are told. And we, we revisit stories that have been told for decades. 
uh, and you've heard them all before, but there's something about the Christmas season, when you hear the Christmas story another time, that you tune in with a little bit more interest. Maybe it's because of the decorations all around, or maybe it's because you know the ending, but there should be a little element of you that is gaining one more piece of insight. And so that is what we are going to do today. We're going to be landing in the book of John, chapter 6, and we're going to tell a story through the j- chapter 6. And uh, you, if you're, if you're a note taker, you can do that on the sheet provided. But, but I'm just going to let you know that uh, there's going to be moments that you're going to fall into this category of, oh, that's a story. There it is. A, it's a story again. And is it really true? Is it real? I mean, sometimes we hear the word story, and sometimes we put on this, well, it's kind of a kid thing. It's uh, make-believe. It's start- Well, for those that might be thinking about that, um, here's the good news. It's not just a story. It's real life. If you were interested in going to King Herod's place of palace and things that he used to uh, rule over, you can do that. The things that you read about in the Bible, you can go do that. We also learned recently that the wise men went to look at this baby Jesus. Of course, of course the wise men went to see baby Jesus because they're wise men and they want to become more wise. But we also learn that the shepherds, the shepherds who were working, they were working out in the fields and for us, that could represent workers that are all around us, that we've always seen. The people that work, uh, when things go wrong in our lives, we count on. A water pipe breaks, or a cable is cut, or the heat doesn't work. Those are workers that we rely on. In those days, the shepherds were those workers. And there they were, going to see what is going on with this baby Jesus. They were there doing their jobs at night when all of heaven broke loose when the baby Jesus was born. What a story. And this is a story today that could never be made up by man. It's too extravagant. It's too, uh, too much for even man to dream up. It's only God himself that can orchestrate such a story. And so we're going to try to answer the question, so why? What now? Why did Jesus come and be born in a manger? When Jesus grew older, he began to minister to those all around him. His ministry was about serving others. And we're going to be taking a look, like I said, about Jesus being the bread of life. The pressing question that hopefully we are able to just embark on today is, what is it my reason here? What am I doing here? We should think that our lives are full of purpose. But oftentimes we operate in a world of should do and should not do. We wake up and we think that our world should be about the do's and don'ts. As long as I just don't do this, I can earn my way to heaven. So the story is set. John chapter 6, Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. Jesus just walked on water. Jesus went from where he fed the 5,000 over to another place. And you can follow up and read all of this in John chapter 6. But then, the disciples were looking for him. And as Lee mentioned, they weren't looking for him because they wanted more of his intellect. They weren't looking for him because they wanted to sit at his feet and learn about his truths. They were looking for him because they were hungry again. They had gotten his meal And so as they started adding up the details of how did you get from here to over there, and you didn't get in the boat, and we we don't understand exactly what's happening. We're looking for you, and Jesus comes on the scene. He says, don't look for me so that I can do more stuff, that I could feed you. Don't look for me so that I can do things like walk on water and mesmerize you. Don't waste your energy striving to say that I can do more things, uh, more works. Work for the food that sticks with you, as Lee so awesomely uh, uh, laid out during the communion meditation. So let's pause. These guys, these people, these disciples, they were not new to the party. Jesus wasn't a new fad. This is not only the first time that they've seen Jesus. They have heard him. He has taught them. They have been around him for, for years. They have just seen him feed 5,000 people. They just saw him walk on water right 
before John chapter 6. And still, they don't quite understand that you are the Son of Man. What is that we need to do? What do we need to do to sh- for you to show us that you love us? What do we need to do? I mean, can you just show us something? Let's pause for a second right there. Imagine for a moment that today, this afternoon, your kids, they come up to you, your kids or, or someone, your loved ones that you spent Christmas with, and you may have opened up gifts, and your kid comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, listen, is there just anything you could do to show me that you love me? I mean, just anything. Could you just show me something? And as you glance down at the tree and notice the gifts that they just opened or the thing that they're playing with or maybe they're writing it or driving it or listening to it, and upon you coming to consciousness and realizing what they're asking for, they're just asking for what are the gifts that you can give me? And the disciples were asking Jesus for the exact same thing. We're about to listen to how the disciples were saying, could you just show me something? And after he told them all they needed to do to be a part of the Son of Man and have meaning in their lives, he's going to answer the question of, why am I here? John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29 says this. If you want to turn there, you can, but you can just listen. It says this. John 6, 28 and 29 says, Then he asked them, then they asked him, they asked Jesus, what must we do to the works, uh, to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that, that we may see it and believe you? Now granted, this is after he's fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And he did walk on water. What is it that you can do to show us? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. And he gave them bread and heaven to eat. The manna came right out of heaven. I mean, that's what our ancestors got. Jesus, what are you going to do for us? Well, Jesus says, throw your belief. Throw everything you have. Put your lot of life into me. And then you know what they did? They argued some more. Why don't you just give us a clue about who you are? Just a hint of what's going on. I mean, like we just said, Moses fed our ancestors. He gave them him. We, he gave them manna to eat when they were in need. And Jesus responded with this. He said, actually, the real significance of Scripture is not that Moses gave them bread, but he gave them bread from the Father. And I am from the Father. I am the bread of life. I am who has sent that manna. Oh, they were excited. The disciples were very excited at that. Oh, master, they said, give us that bread. Let us have part of that bread. If Jesus, again, at this point I would think would be somewhat exasperated. I am the bread of life, he says. That's in about, cha- in about verse 36 to 38. He says, I am the person who aligns with he who gave bread. He is the, the bread of life. I have told you over and over, but, and though you have even seen me in action, you've actually heard words from my lips, and I have told you that I am the bread of life, you don't really believe me. And then he goes on to say that every person that the Father actually believes in, and he goes on to also say people that believe in him and the Father, they'll come running to him, and he holds on to them and keeps them. And he says to the disciples, he says, I came down from heaven. I came here, not on my own whim, but because Christ, because God, my Father, sent me to accomplish love. In a nutshell, he says that everything handed over to me by the Father is to be completed. Not every, not any single detail will be missed. And this is what my Father wants, he says. Anyone who sees a son trusts who he is and what he does and aligns his life with them will have what I'm saying, real life, will have eternal life. And then, you know what they said? 
Jesus turns and he says, so if you understand what I'm saying, I am the bread that came down from him. I am the bread of life. Whoa. Now they start to argue again. Now, hold on. Isn't this guy the son of Joseph? Isn't this guy Jesus, son of Mary, who was born in a manger? How in the world do we believe that he came from heaven? Don't we know his dad? Don't we know G Joseph? He's saying, I came down from heaven? How can he expect anyone to believe that? How could anyone believe that? Even though they just witnessed the things that we shared and Jesus comes back. In verse 43, he says, don't bicker amongst yourselves. Don't argue about me. You're not in charge of me. But the Father who sent me is in charge, and he draws people to him. That's what I'm here for. So the disciples are confused. They're confused because they don't know exactly how they should just accept Jesus for who he is because they know his dad, and they don't quite understand the concept, and here they are walking amongst him. And they also don't understand that they are being personally taught by God. The early writings in the Old Testament was leading up to just this point. Anyone who has spent any time listening, Jesus says, listening to me, will understand that it'll come to you and that your eyes have seen and your ears have heard what I give you. And no one has seen the Father except the one who has been alongside the Father. And that is me. And so, therefore, he says to the disciples, you see me, you hear me, so you're hearing the Father. And he says, I'm telling you the most truth that I can possibly share with you, that you believe in me, you follow what I'm asking you to do, you'll have eternal life. I am the bread of life. And then he says, the ancestors that you're referring to, they've got bread, uh, they got manna from heaven. You're correct, they did. And then they also died. But now what I'm sharing with you is that the bread that you take from me and the, what you believe in me and your life follows me is not just bread to feed you, but it's bread of life. And it's bread that you will not die. I am the bread. I'm the living bread who came down from heaven. And anyone who eats this bread will live. And not just live for a day or a week or a year, but live forever. And so the bread that I present to the world, Jesus says, and the bread that I present to you all listening it's more than myself. It's more than the flesh and the blood. Oh, boy. Flesh and blood? You want us to eat your flesh and drink your blood? Again, as amazing as it sounds, they started bickering again. Later on in the chapter, the Jews started fighting amongst themselves. How can this man be calling himself a meal? How can his body be representation of the bread and his blood? Well, he says, As you eat and you drink my flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you, have, you will have life living inside of you. They were crazy. They were going nuts about this. Eat flesh and drink blood? But Jesus was making it crystal clear. That my flesh is the real food and my blood is, is drink. But by eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you'll enter into me and I will enter into you. And I live because of him. I live. I, Jesus. I live because the Father has given it to me. This is the bread from heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died like I shared. But whoever eats the bread will live always. Then why are we here? What now? What about this baby Jesus? We should live our lives to look as we're looking toward a baby lying in a manger. There comes a divine purpose for every life that comes into this world. God has a task for every man, for every woman, child, a task for us to perform. And there's a blueprint that he has. How do we figure out that blueprint? We figure out that blueprint through people, through worship through prayer, through experiences, through the Bible. We figure out our blueprint by allowing God to take the reins, by allowing God to drive the vehicle that we are in. Jesus was born to bring love and bring love into the world. 
In Jesus' world, there wasn't a lot of love before he showed up. There wasn't welfare societies that existed. There weren't any hospitable care and hospitals that took care of the weak and the lame. There were not many orphanages that you read about in the Old Testament. There were no caring organizations that looked out for the weak and those that were hurting. And then Jesus was born. And along with him came the need to share. Along with him came the need to establish a kingdom based on love. A famous military leader, the great Napoleon, once said, he once said, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rely on for such accomplishment? We, we relied upon force. And Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this very hour, says Napoleon, millions of men and women would die for him. So essentially, we're asking to this morning, you know, why are we here? How does the story of baby born in a manger make sense to us? Well, we fast forwarded from when he was a baby to when he was in his ministry. And I'm going to fast forward one more time into John chapter 18. In the John chapter 18 is when Jesus himself was, was brought before Pilate. He says, so... So you were called the king of the Jews, I hear. And Jesus says, well, it's not my kingdom, but my father's kingdom. And it doesn't consist of what you see around you. It's a bigger, more vast presence. It's a kingdom that my father has set in motion of love. And that's why I'm here. You call me a king, but I tell you that I am of love. So are you a king or are you not a king, says Pilate. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, because I am a king. I was born and I entered the world so that I would witness to the truth. I would bear truth to all that came around me. And everyone who cares for truth, who has any feeling for the truth, recognizes my voice. But if I was of your world, those that believed in me would be fighting would be at war, but they're not, because they're not of this world, they're of me. So here's the good news. The good news this morning is this, is that the message is free. It's free for us to receive. It's free that God has laid out his love for us. While we are still sinners, Christ died on a cross for us. So let's take a look at these gifts again. So the gifts that I was sharing before, of course, were a representation of what God has given us. And it's not, it's not okay for us to consider ourselves okay by having some gifts. It's not okay God didn't ask us to have gifts and not share them. Jesus Christ didn't come to this world for us to see the gifts and not open them. God didn't die on a cross and forgive us of our sins so that we had gifts but didn't share them with others. It's not for status. We don't put them in a car and drive around with them. And sometimes we have better gifts than others. We're not braggadocious about it, but we realize that we have skills and abilities that maybe some other people don't, so we share those with others. What are we talking about here? We're talking about that God came, sent a son to establish a kingdom of love. We need to use those gifts. In fact, biblically speaking, we're told that if we don't use those gifts, we're sinning. If we just keep them in our house and we dust them off and let people come see them, we're sinning. Jesus came, was born in a manger, and it's no coincidence that he was born because there's no room for them in the inn where it's comfortable and heated and light was there and it's sterile. No, he was born in a trough with all the animals we need to use those gifts. We need to share those gifts. We need to nurture the gifts that God has given us. And so, yes, this story that we are looking at this morning in John chapter 6, we've heard that before. But I want you to know, it's, we didn't point this out this morning. I didn't tell this story this morning so that we could know that, well, just even, even the disciples amongst him didn't believe. So how do you expect me, over 2,000 years uh, later, 
to believe in someone that I can't see, I can't hear, I can't, well, here's the good news. The good news is that it is all around us. And as I shared earlier, the Bible is real. He is alive. And experiences and our worship and the fact that we allow Jesus to run our lives, the fact that we accept him into our into our lives and to guide and to navigate who we are as people and the choices that we make and the fact that we use the gifts that he's given us. It's no coincidence. So in closing, I would like us to know that the old familiar passage in John, so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, we've heard it. Many of us have heard that for many, many years, but do we believe that? And this Christmas season is a really great time for us to re, um, revisit that story and that truth. So why did Jesus come and born in a manger? To save us is why he came, to show love. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us in our lives. Lord, we, um, we come into this place to worship you. And though you know our very hearts, you know when we are going to mess up, you know uh, that we will fall short. But Lord, I pray that today we go from this place changed. We're changed because you changed us, not for some bread that we took today, uh, juice that we drank, or some words that were spoken, but, but you. We allow that place in our heart to be opened up for you, for you to dwell inside of us and help us make the, cha- the changes and help us behave in the way that you would like us to do so that we can not only act the way you would like but others can see you living in us thank you lord for all you do in jesus name amen